everyone, my name is Sylvia Gorajek and this is Valley Talks. Today I'm very excited to welcome John Vlasopoulos, entrepreneur, angel investor and CEO and founder of Fabric, interest-driven uh, discovery network. Hello John, I'm so happy you joined me today. Hello Sylvia. In the past years you've been working in corporations, you also founded a couple startups mm -hmm. and now you're running your own startups. Do you see yourself more as an investor or as an entrepreneur? Uh, that's a very good question and nice to be here. Thank you for having me. So um, I like to see I'm both because I am both, but I think it's an interesting question when you meet people at a party. Uh, do you introduce yourself as a, if you're a yoga teacher on the side, but you're also an entrepreneur and you know, which part of you do you present um, when you meet people? So I think it depends on the event. Sometimes I'm a, you know, I'm a dad with the kids and sometimes I'm an investor if I'm an investor event. And if I'm raising money, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, but I think by having done both sides, uh, hopefully you're a better entrepreneur and hopefully you're a better investor. So I understand the side of the entrepreneur when I'm thinking about investing and I understand the side of the um, investor when I'm being an entrepreneur. Later on I want to ask you about how does being an investor impact raising money for your startup, mm -hmm. but tell us more about Fabric. You launched it about a year ago mm -hmm. and also you just launched Fab FM. Mm -hmm. What are these platforms doing and what is it exactly? Sure, well, you, you called it out in the beginning. So um, we're an interest-driven discovery network. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, so our thesis is we all started a number of years ago with social networks based around people. And I think at the beginning of the social network era, there was a large tie between the people and their interests. So the kids started in Facebook around similar colleges. So they were already kind of similar, similar people. Same thing with Twitter. It started with very small networks, people following less people. So as both those networks have grown, the people networks, they've onboarded more and more people. So the signal of interest has been diluted. So they've been more about mass and mass and mass number of people and you're encouraged to invite all your friends who may or may not share your interests, your cousins, your aunties, that person you met. So we feel that it's now time to kind of not do a do-over, uh, but base a network around interests specifically uh, and have the people flow from the interests. So we think that's a more efficient way to have a network where you can find things that are interesting to you. Um, and hopefully we're also driving to commerce. So you have platforms like Pinterest and Twitter that are struggling to integrate commerce sort of later in their, in their experience because again it's anchored around people. So we feel if we can start with a platform that's based around interests, um, you don't need to follow anyone. So in Fabric you just express yourself so through a sort of Tinder style swipe. So we have people doing thousands and thousands of uh, swipes uh, expressing themselves uh, currently in the areas of music and movies and TV. Um, so then we use that graph to connect you with people. So you don't need to have that problem that a lot of companies have when they're trying to start a new network going, there is no one here, invite your friends, right? Which we see some people like, you know, pitching me. So as soon as you come into Fabric, you immediately have people um, who are presented to you who actually share your interests. You can see why they're in your network and it could be your friends, it could be new people, but you see sort of why they're there. So the hope is they're then presenting to you news and recommendations and packs that you can swipe that should be interesting to you. And the more you contribute, you sort of help them. Um, so it's driving discovery because it's based around common interests. Then we have a way that you can keep track of all the things you want to do. So we have sort of a list, kind of like an Evernote, you know, for interests. But you can keep track of all the things you want to do. And the cool thing is that the people manage the list. So all mm -hmm. the people like you can work out if Man in the High Castle should be, maybe it's number one for you, but it's number 10 for me, right? So depending on who our influencer taste mm -hmm. friends are, uh, it kind of reorganizes the list. It's this living, breathing list to help you find out what to do next. And then the last part is we feel that content and commerce sit naturally together. Um, so we have all the commerce partnerships arranged on the back end where you can link to buy or do whatever it is that you've been inspired and saved, you can then do. And then wrapped around all of that as a social component um, where again, you're not connected with the people first, you're connected with them based on interest, but you can message them where if you find you and I are a 90% match in television and I'm thinking about watching a show, I can ask you maybe for recommendations or I see you posting something and I make a comment. So there's a, there's a people connection to it, but it's anchored around interest. Um, and then you mentioned FabFM, so that's actually launched pretty much today, I think in the last 24 hours. So that was a way that we wanted to express the, kind of the, the fabric intelligence platform. Um, to see what we could do to help the music industry. I started there. So now it's pretty hard to find you know, good playlists. It's pretty hard to build a playlist. You have to 
have songs on your hard drive and upload them, which seems very laborious. So we wanted to use our sort of intelligent platform algorithm and swipe to create a better way to, to build and share playlists. So you can just put in a, a song or an artist that you love, um, and then from that we'll give you hundreds of songs that you can swipe through to build your playlist, and then at any time you can save it to now Spotify or any of the music services, so then it's, it's, uh, it's also saved a copy there, and then you can share it with your friends, and then you can discover other people's playlists who share interests with you. Fab FM is right now uh, only on the web. Correct. And is it going to stay like this, or are you going to build them up as well? It, that's a great question. So um, I think there's kind of a pyramid of engagement. So I had an agency before, so we've been working with brands on a consulting basis, and now I'm kind of consulting myself as the company. Um, so th there's an obsession with apps, and I think, again, we've all seen the statistics, the top 20 apps are sort of controlled by three companies. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it's hard to break into, especially daily use, uh, of an app, and if I tell you, um, you know, hey Sylvia, like check out our app, and you have to know which app store, and then you have to search for it, and maybe the search terms aren't right. So it's 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 great if you can get people there, uh, but we just feel for what we're doing, we wanted to test an expression of Fabric in the browser, and see if we could do swipe in the browser, and see how it works. Where you know we've been loosely mentioning it to a few people that I think are interesting, like around town, and I'll say just check out Fab Fabafin. They go, it's an app. And I go, no, 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 just go to your browser. They go, oh, it's so easy. And I, I just type tried, in. Yeah. yeah. You can even swipe on the computer. Yeah, yeah, you can do it on the computer. There's no reason really not to. And I think the apps that we had before on iOS, we just wrapped in Cordoba in PhoneGap, mm -hmm. which is really HTML5. So we, we're building in HTML5. And we think more and more can be done in HTML5 um, that could also be replicated in, a, in an app. I think if you're a game, you have you know, more limited options where you need to leverage the accelerometer and you need to leverage, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of processing power and VR. And, but for what we're doing, we think we can, um, you know, do mu much of it in the browser. But to wrap it, so we'll also probably do it as an app to experiment. You know, do people prefer it as an app? Do we prefer it in the browser? At least with the app, they can have it saved on their phone and, you know, there's some things we can make a little bit more efficient. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, we'll probably do an app uh, as well. It's not too hard to wrap and release. I want to ask you more questions about Fabric in a moment, but let's circle back to previous years of your career. Sure. You were born in London, in England. Correct. <laughs> and then you moved to Asia. Correct. After Asia, you ended up in New York. After New York, you moved to Hollywood. Uh -huh. And now you're in San Francisco. Uh -huh. First of all, what were you doing in Asia? That's a good question. And um, by the way, excellent research. Um, so. Uh, I originally, I wanted to, to get into law. My father was a lawyer. Um, and then I was in the Merchant Navy. And uh, I ended up in Singapore. And um, kind of liked Asia. Like, mm -hmm. I liked Asia and went to Hong Kong and started like working in bars and getting involved in music. And um, long story short, uh, I ended up not wanting to, to leave and go back and study what I was going to study. Uh, so I switched my course at the last minute. I saw a a Sikh advisor in Kowloon Park and he did my stones and he recommended that I should go home. I didn't know if I should stay or go. <laughs> so I went back and managed to get a position at a, a good night like, UK to Durham uh, to study Chinese and, and economics. So those were the things because I was working in Hong Kong, I was speaking like bad Cantonese, so I wanted to improve my Chinese and I was kind of working in business, so I wanted to improve my business skills. So I went back kind of with a vocational minded degree, I really knew what I wanted to do and left Hong Kong uh, and literally like started, you know, one week later at uh, college. And then I went for my second year back out to Beijing, um, got into DJing mm. in, uh, in China in the early 90s. And then I'd always been very passionate about music. So I desperately wanted to get into the music business and then managed to find a job in Korea for EMI. Um, and then from EMI, I went over to Hong Kong uh, to work for BMG for my fantastic first boss. Uh, Michael Smelly, who I'm actually seeing next month for, for dinner, Australian guy. So anyway, so that, that was what led me initially to be interested in Asia, kind of studying languages, and I did a minor in Korean, and then back out to work in, in the region, and then went from Hong Kong to Tokyo, and Tokyo to New York. But working for Bertelsmann was the parent company. So then was New York chapter? Then was New York chapter, so that was an exciting time. I think, um, I was talking to my wife yesterday, like in the early days, there was probably in the late 90s, you know, a couple of hundred execs around the world who were 
digital, right? Everything was more of the traditional business, especially with the media. Um, so in, in New York, it was kind of the peak of the early digital era. So working for Bertelsmann, um, we did Napster and uh, we bought Columbia House. So we, had, we were working with a lot of uh, all the digital companies looking to acquire and build. We spun up a lot of new businesses uh, for the media companies. So it was kind of like digital 1.0. And during that time, I transitioned to mobile, so I went to AT&T. So I think then at that time, there were a couple of hundred execs around the world who were mobile guys or mobile digital, mobile data guys, as mm -hmm. opposed to voice guys. Um, so sort of early on that trend, and then obviously now, you know, then everyone became digital and mm -hmm. everyone became mobile. Um, so yeah, New York was a fantastic time. I love New York. I've still got a, got a place there. So, you know, I hope to spend more time in New York, fantastic city. And then... Um, AT&T got bought by Singular, so um, that was good, uh, 37 billion or something. So then I had an opportunity to work in television, which took me to LA. That took you to LA. And mm. then, so you worked at Endemo in Hollywood. Yep. That's the global biggest um, TV production company. Mm. And what were you actually doing at Endemo and how did you like it there? So I, I just wanted to get on television. No, I didn't really. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, originally, I did want to be a music supervisor to get into to film. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd always been fascinated at Bertelsmann due to regulations in the States. We weren't able, in Europe, we had television um, stations and production, but in, in the States, we weren't able to do them. So I'd always been interested in television. Um, and a recruiter, recruiters always seem to know more about us than we know. So I had a call from a recruiter going, we know you love television. It's like, how do you know that? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so anyway, so I went to meet with Endemol, had no idea who they were uh, as a company, right? Because I think only if you're in the business, you would maybe know them. Um, and uh, yeah, met with, uh, met with the company. It seemed, seemed very interesting. They were going through similar um, sort of early digital changes that we went through in the music business. So there were things that I could apply from what I'd done previously to the TV industry. So this is Hollywood in like 2005. Um, so went in as a head of digital um, and then started doing, so we had a show called Deal or No Deal, uh, which mm -hmm. was a popular game show. And we started doing interactivity in the show that some of our colleagues in Europe were doing but had never really been done in the US. We did American Idol when I was at AT&T uh, and it went really well. So I think we did 17 million or something the first, first year out the gate. So that allowed me then to build more of a division and we did original programming, kind of like Maker Studios and full screen mm -hmm. and doing now, sort of programs for, exclusively for the web. Um, and started doing more uh, you know, branded content than on sort of te television. And then I started producing TV shows. So I had a uh, kind of a hit game show on BT and another one on TBS. Um, so yeah, so I really enjoyed my time in, in LA, got onto the board of the TV industry. Um, so it was, you know, it was a bunch of us early on seeing, again, we'd seen music go from analog to digital. We were then seeing kind of video go from analog to digital and all the impacts and similarities. Uh, and then I took over advertising to see how the brands mm -hmm. also integrated, which has kind of always been my sweet spot between advertising, you know, tech and media. Uh, so yeah, enjoyed it. And then we got sold. So then we got sold to Goldman Sachs and uh, some other people. So a bunch of us left and uh, then I came up to run a company in San Francisco. To start your own company here? So this was actually not my company. It was a company that um, some Japanese investors brought me in to, to run. Um, so I'd never run a company before. So this was a 100-person company um, that was a mobile content company. Um, so that was still involved in ringtones. It was kind of on the downward path of you know, a 10-year cycle of, of ringtones. So we turned that more into a, a studio producing content and producing apps and working with brands, so more like a content studio, uh, producing our own IP and doing service work for Coca-Cola and Intel. Uh, and then we sold that business. Um, and during that time, I'd started doing some angel investing because being in San Francisco, which we can talk about. Um, and then from that, I had the idea for Fabric, um, you know, which is what we're doing now. And there was a, a kind of another part of the story that was a, an application called Trailer Pop, which was all part of the Fabric family. Uh, it's kind of all, you know, the company official name is Trailer Pop, but we have Fabric as the main brand. And that was um, movie trailers where you could play trivia against um, 10,000, 20,000 movie trailers. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that's still going. So we're featured on the App Store in the going to the movies section all the time. Um, and that has a monthly base that continues, but we wanted to do something bigger with, with Fabric. 
When you had Fabric ready, uh, how did you get the first users? So, um, I think, you know, to be honest, like we're really, so this year we're now raising a, a new round from, from more institutional investors. Uh, so this is really our growth year. Mm -hmm. So up to now, um, it's really been word of mouth. So we got, you know, okay. 10,000 that, like, of people around the world who've literally just found it. We haven't spent a dollar on marketing. Um, and we've got, you know, people in Scotland and Singapore and, you know, Africa. And so people have kind of found it and told their friends. There's an aspect of it when you're going through the packs that you can share. Uh, so kind of like BuzzFeed, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, 21 movies to check out on Netflix this month. It's kind of fun. So people will share that to social media um, and then people will come back in again. So yeah, so currently it's more word of mouth, but this year we have a more uh, targeted plan for, for kind of marketing and growth. So what's your plan for marketing? I'm curious about what strategies can you be taking to, to get more users for Fabric for an platform like this? Sure. So one is like engaging with fantastic press and TV shows like uh -huh. yours <laughs> with, with global, global distribution and reach. So I'm sure this has been broadcast all around the world. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, number one, we're, we think we're in a good position because we're dealing in pop culture, mm -hmm. right? So everyone wants to be a better version of themselves. Everyone wants to know more. Everyone wants to do, you know, cool things and everyone wants to not waste time searching for stuff or getting frustrated. And I think right now there's this little bit of a frustration with Twitter and, and you know, it's, it's kind of all, there's a lot of noise. So people are wanting more personalization. They're wanting higher value. And I think the general you know, background markets are moving from ad supported to commerce, right? So, so we think one, if we can deliver first and foremost is a great product that delivers against that where people, mm -hmm. my ambition is I can send it to, to anyone, um, send it to your sister, cousin, friend or whatever without saying anything and they you know, download it or access it on the web and go, I get it. So that's, that's our first ambition is to build a product that people immediately kind of without explanation go, I see value in in what you're doing because that then encourages them to, they have a little secret, so then they want to tell their friends. So mm -hmm. first and foremost is building a great product that meets consumers' needs. And then we've also been working with different celebrities for them to participate in the platform so you can see their favorite movies and TV shows. What celebrities and, do you have on Fabric? So we have um, some bands like The Script, um, Oli Moors are these, these big, maybe more international artists, but The Script are big here too. Um, we have uh, yeah, Amy Smart, who's a, like a big actress, Deepak Chopra. You know, we, so we kind of have a, a mix of, uh, you know, sort of interesting people and everyone's interesting to someone. When it comes to raising money, um, do you think it may be easier for you to raise money for your startup since you're an angel investor yourself? Uh, does it make any difference to your investors? Do they, does it give you any extra credibility, you think? So it's a good question. Uh -huh. I mean, maybe you have to ask my investors. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> But I think it definitely gives me a, a perspective because when I've said a lot of the things that, you know, mm -hmm. investors would say to me, so I can kind of sniff out That's also, what they're really saying. Yes, what I wanted to ask you, how yeah. much of your knowledge are you actually implementing in your own startups? Because, you know, one thing is to advise others, but yeah. the other thing is to kind of, you know, not lose the distance and, and be using your own knowledge to your own projects. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I think... And again, to be 100% clear, I think I said at the beginning that I'm kind of equal investor mm -hmm. and an entrepreneur. I think that would be kind of mentally from a practical perspective. I'm like, in terms of what I do every week, I'm like 98% or 99% entrepreneur and 1% investor in terms of time that I spend. So I'm very much nights and weekends. And if I'm really passionate about an industry or a sector or a problem that needs solving, in some cases, I'll seek out the entrepreneur. Um, so there's a company I invested in called Van Gogh, which is an art buying platform. Uh, which is great connecting artists who have a hard time making money mm. um, to people who would like great art in their home. Um, so that's a great, I mean, so that was a great idea. And I was sitting on my couch looking at a wall. We'd like moved into our house going, we need art. Where do I go to get art? And then I found Van Gogh and kind of emailed the info at um, and said, love what you're doing. Can we have a meet, met for a coffee and then ended up investing. Um, and I think they're doing a, a great job. So yeah, so I think having a perspective um, and being very passionate about whatever you're doing. I think investors recognize. Mm -hmm. And then obviously as an entrepreneur, you've got to really, really like feel and be driven for what you're doing. So that works on both sides. Um, and I think tips, you know, tips I give for founders looking for investment sort of 
both sides of me is one, just really do your research on who looks at what from an investment perspective, because there's no more of a waste of time of hitting someone up who invests in IoT or SaaS platforms um, and they're not really doing what you're doing. So kind of do your homework uh, in the beginning and, you know, and the investors respect that and then treat everyone. I think the whole thing again about all the networks and investing is, is it's all people, right? So people have families, people have other interests. So if you can find when you're talking to an investor, you know, a connection of what they just wrote about or a blog post they did or something and pick up on a theme, then it starts with a conversation. And then if you like the person, again, going back to the interest matching, I think there's maybe fabric for investment. <laughs> um, actually, we did think about it. So if you think about LinkedIn, um, we have all these different connections on LinkedIn and we have no idea who sometimes they, who they are. Yeah. Right? But we've kind of accumulated them over the years. I try to be as... In case they are helpful sometimes. In, in case the they're helpful sometimes. <laughs> but let's say then you have a, um, a big company and you want to sell to me, right? Then you have a team of 20 salespeople, which is common in... In, uh, in sort of the LinkedIn world, and you're trying to you have a sales meeting, right, who knows John? And half of your team are connected to me on LinkedIn, and two of the guys go, yeah, I'll do it, I met him at the conference, and blah, blah, blah. So they come in and sell to me, and I don't really like either of them, so we don't do business, versus if there was kind of a fabric API, mm -hmm. and you could immediately see who was the most compatible mm -hmm. of your team of 10, and then it was actually Mark and Katie, and they came in, and we were a 90% match, which we think is a great proxy for being you know, compatible as people, right? So then we start talking, oh, I just saw this, and I thought, wow, and, and there's a little bit of vanity going on. It's like, wow, you're just like me, and you're just like me. So we like each other, and then obviously, I want to hang out and do business with people I like. So then, anyway, so we, we think- That's a great have... idea. Was it born just right now? Just right now. Here? Okay, cool, we there should do it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, I think, again, overall, if we all take, I also do some, some matchmaking selectively on the side. So again, fascinated with, with people, I think if we all look at businesses um, and networks from a very human perspective and investing, uh, it's it, you know it's people who want to do. Everyone wants to generally do good things, um, wants to make an impact on the world. So if you as an entrepreneur or you as an investor can find your match, that's when you have the I, oh yeah, and like you know we're doing and they're going, no, no, you could do this and you could do this, and then I think that's when the chemistry happens, um, and when people then become your big backer or you become someone else's backer. The side point of that, I think, on the, um, on the fundraising is some of our smallest investors um, have been the most helpful. Mm. So I think it's not necessary, again, that the biggest check is the biggest help. Um, the smallest guy is going back to if you can really find people who are like, passionate and motivated and then just inherently they can't help helping you, right? Because it's something that they've been thinking about or you know, they want to contribute mm -hmm. to. Yeah, so don't always think, sometimes people say it's 25 grand or nothing. You know, but a few that we've we've allowed, like sort of under the under the level, have been some of the most helpful investors. Uh, you know that we've had. Still going back um, to raising money for Fabric. Sure. Uh, you raised uh, something about one point five million dollars for Fabric, mm -hmm. and now you're raising another round. Mm -hmm. So, are you using your current connections for that, or are you reaching out to new investors? How are you actually doing this? It's a great it's a natural uh, segue, I think, from what I was saying. Just now, so mm -hmm. one of our invest, so we're using our current um, investor network. We're being very selective on who we talk to, so we're just looking to raise another one and a half, but we're pricing it, so it'll be a series seed, uh, and we're already pretty advanced in in the discussions. And the introductions have come; uh, at least sixty percent have come from initial current investors. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we're looking for one. I'm saying that Asian fund. We're looking for maybe a couple, one or two strategic investors. So OEM, media companies, and then we're looking for one sort of valley anchor. Um, so yeah, so the, the, again, if you find people who have that fire, you know, they naturally can't help. I just mentioned Van Gogh, I think is a great idea, and the Laurel and Wolf. So I mean, you, these are ideas that we all have in our head for whatever reason as an investor or an entrepreneur that need to be solved. So they can't help then telling other people. So that's been very helpful for us in, in the raising of the new rounds were connected to some very interesting Asian funds and some very interesting European strategics. And so, um, so yeah, and we, we, hopefully we'll, we'll get it done and we won't need to look any further, but uh, I think we've met with maybe six or seven companies and it's all been generally, generally positive so far. Um, but beyond that, again, it's, it's finding the, the companies and the investors. Um, so one investor we're talking to has asked if he could introduce us to an investor that he invests with. 
the, again around the same theme or thesis. So everyone's obsessed with themes and thesis, theses. Um, so you know we have a clear thesis, which is this melding of kind of media, actionable media, content, and commerce. There's a bunch of people that that makes sense to. People have been trying to drive commerce. People have been trying to drive messaging platforms, engagement, and media and editorial. And um, so yeah, so that's that's been the approach so far. But generally, everyone's been quite helpful uh, so far. When some founders want to approach you, uh, mm. and you mostly invest in female-founded startups, actually, do you invest only in female-founded startups? Uh, no. And why? And why? Yes. So um, three reasons. Okay. So and to answer your other question, so I know I don't exclusively invest in female mm -hmm. founded startups, um, but I try to invest in either female founded startups or uh, markets where they're solving a predominantly female audience problem. So it could be either side, either the market or the founders, and they're, you know mixed teams. So it's not exclusive to okay. the men. I've invested. <laughs> so I invested in a company that got bought by. Um, Fitbit, which is a fitness company started by a fantastic male entrepreneur. Um, so, uh, so yeah, three reasons. Number one, I feel currently in the in the value of the investing, you know, markets worldwide, women are under underrepresented, and I think I don't think that's a good thing. So, I would like. I think some. I feel I have some affinity towards women. I do the matchmaking, and I have, you know, have a daughter and have a wife. You know, so I kind of mm -hmm. have some understanding, um, and I think. And also the markets that I've worked in previously in television and music, they're sort of media and worked in advertising, so they're sort of female friendly. So the things that I'm interested in, I think somewhat align, not that female founders can't do amazing SaaS companies, which is not my area, but of the more sort of lifestyle, entertainment, you know, travel, health, um, design type businesses, I have an affinity personally for that and I have an affinity professionally. So that was one. It kind of overlapped with what I know and what I'm interested in. And two is the fact that I feel Women are underrepresented and need need help. So if I can help both on a coaching perspective as well as a investment perspective, I think that's a good thing. And then three, to be perfectly honest, as a small investor, I'm not writing enormous checks. It's good for me to have a focus. So I've actually got pretty good deal flow from either other entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs that I've invested in, or hearing that I support female entrepreneurs. People will send me when they're not focused on that, or other female entrepreneurs have a friend. So my, my deal flow, if you like, has, has been helpful because I'm, I have a kind of a brand or a focus in terms of any investment. Do you think some investors avoid female founders? I don't think so. Okay. I mean, again, I don't know. I don't, I don't know every investor and I, I can't be in their head, but I, I would hope not. Um, I think um, hopefully everything is focused on the idea uh, and it's irrespective of black, white, you know, male, female, who's presenting the idea. If the idea is good, um, hopefully investors are looking for good ideas. Uh, so no, I, I, I would hope not, um, but again, I don't know every investor. Um, and I think, you know, again, for female founders, which you are as well, I think trying to get more of a network where, you know, there was the statistics recently that in San Francisco, the number of funded companies and A rounds like decreased yes. year on year, mm -hmm. New York increased. So there's someone, I think, of a feeling within the female entrepreneur world that you know, there's only X number of women who are going to get a deal this, this quarter and it's going to be me. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Right? So I'm hoping that we can connect where there's strength in numbers mm -hmm. and you can share and it could be not just me, but it could be all of you. And then there could be double the next quarter and double the next quarter. So just getting some type of community, which is, which is tough when you're in an early stage um, company and there's a lot of competition. And mm -hmm. on the one hand, you want to support your, you know, your uh, fellow female um, entrepreneur community, but on the other hand, you really, really want to get, you know, funding to keep going. So I think they can both work to work together. So hopefully, for me, as not, I'm not a woman, right? <laughs> so I can act as a yeah. as a go between to go. Oh, well, you should talk to them because they talk to them, and even just sharing knowledge and deals and like I can say, well, I'm a I'm a you know, female audience, female founder friendly investor. I know three other people, so like through me, you can meet with them, and then we will start meeting each other, and then there's a little bit of a place that people can go out. And let's say they would want to approach you. What is the best way that they should do it? You mentioned that they should obviously know you as much as they can, do research about you, but what do, should they do? Should they send you an email or contact you on LinkedIn? Or what, what, what's the first step they should take? Yeah, I, I think, again, going back to the people, okay. like how do you make friends and how do you contact people? So uh -huh. in, in general, um, I'm on the different platforms. So they could tweet at me. You know, they could they could send me a note on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think the most important thing is that if they have passion for what they're doing and, and it's, it's an overlay or you know, it overlays with um, areas that I've invested in or I said something that I'm interested in on this or some of the interview or, or story and they're coming going, I am doing this. And it's like, here's our traction and here's what we're doing. I think because I'm a smaller investor, it's better that the company has a little bit of traction mm -hmm. um, because I'm not, I'm not big enough to really, really go like at the inception set phase, but it's like, yeah, we've been getting 5,000 a month and we've been trying this and it seems to be going to 10 and you know, then I can, that's, that's a good time. Uh, to get going. But re regardless of that, even if it's a advice, if it's not saying we're, we're early or we're later, but I'd love to talk, you know, mm -hmm. I met a great woman in uh, at CES from GoPro and I think she was at Stanford and professional gymnast and she was like very active in. So anyway, so I'm also interested in meeting that the female entrepreneur community and doing what I can to, to support it. But for investment specifically, you know, short little email, here's traction, here's what we're doing, here's kind of what we're solving, nothing spectacular. And my email, so I have a, I've been thinking about turning it into a fund more formally mm -hmm. and raising 10 or $15 million where I can do it with other people's money and my money. Um, so the loose name of that, haven't told anyone, but it's uh, A-Force Ventures. Uh, so A-Force is a reference to Marvel's first all-female superhero mm -hmm. group, which I think is coming out, the movie like, next year or the next year. So anyway, so I'm John, J-O-N, at aforceventures.com if anyone wants to email me. So one of the last questions, uh, among the advice that you gave to mm. uh, founders was that cash is the king and that they should really pay attention to what they are spending money mm. um, on, especially at the very, very beginning. Mm. Um, one of my questions then is, let's say they have a patentable um, idea or mm -hmm. um, code or, you know, solution. Mm. Would you advise to go for patenting pretty much before they go to market or which obviously is costly mm -hmm. that costs you know a lot of money mm -hmm. when it comes to that stage or should they um, not care about this first and not spend that money and just um, build the product test it maybe even get a couple first customers and only then worry about patenting so um, another one of my rules thank you for remembering the catcher kings and another one is like focus on building something that even a small group of people I passionately love um, and have that be the, the initial focus. So I think sometimes the legal side of it can outweigh just getting something. It's like what we're doing, which could, we're thinking in a year, is going to be amazing and like the mm -hmm. patent, we've got to patent it, but, but they still haven't got people using it. So yeah, so I would say find a provisional patent. If you gen and, and generally people who, who should be filing patents would know why they're filing patents. I don't think it's for everyone, but if you think you should and you've worked around patents and you've had a patent before, you've been co so you kind of know the process of when you should. Um, you can always find a provisional patent, which is less expensive. Um, yeah, but generally I would focus less on the, on the legal mm -hmm. side, in the, and, unless again, your idea is, is so out there, um, you know, Hyperloop and flying drone, you know, whatever. If, if it's really, really out there, you probably would know anyway, because you're a PhD and you've been working so you, you understand the patterns. If you're a general sort of entrepreneur and you think you have something cool, I would just get it out there, make sure it, it is cool, and then file a provisional patent, which is not that hard, and then wait. You have whatever it is, a year and a half, to, to decide if you want to file a full patent, which is more, more money. What's the plan for Fabric? Um, we spoke about it a little bit, but what's your goal for this year? I know that it's raising money, but mm -hmm. um, anything else that you can share with us? And also, what is the bigger picture for Fabric? Um, so yeah, so the, the, I think the grand plan is, I had a company 20 years ago called Beatlink, um, and this was before social networks, and I had this idea of connecting the world around culture. culture. So we call things like music and movies and TV cultural currency. Mm -hmm. So our big aim, my big aim is to connect the world where we can all be closer together uh, in terms of understanding. So you from Poland, I'd love to know what are the top 10 movies or books that have really made you who you are? Um, from either your perspective from Poland or, or Polish, you know, culture and understand that. And then that might interest me in Polish food and maybe traveling to Poland. And, uh, and when I meet a Polish person, I immediately have a kind of a groundwork to base a relationship on to, to start to discuss. So the same thing, I think right now the world is still very kind of segregated. Um, and a lot of that can be solved as, as, you know, religion and country boundaries or everything are starting to meld and break down and ideology is changing. I think we're all, 
we've all been brought up around kind of you know pop culture and interests. Uh, so I think if we can get people to share at scale, um, and then start connecting the world where we can have communities. I would love my friend if my friend one friend is our most compatible is an you know 18 year old guy from Botswana and someone else is a 59 year old you know woman from Belgium. But we all share interests and we're all connecting, and I can learn from them and they can learn from me. You know, hopefully we can make the more, world a little smaller and more accessible, um, and have more tolerance and you know hopefully. Uh, yeah, hopefully we can achieve that with Fabric. In terms of the immediate term, you know, our goal is to prove, so this theory that we think we can do is connecting around, you know, people around interest, basing it around interest and taste, and that leading to discovery. So our immediate goal is to prove that that engine is working. So we're looking to get to sort of a million, a million active users over the next 18 months um, mm -hmm. and show all the things that we're talking about that we have. So we have people swiping on average 3,000 times um, and sharing 3,000 data points, which is a lot. Right, so we want to see that scale, see how we can impact commerce um, in the short term. So, uh, so yeah, that's our, that's our grand plan for Fabric. John, it's been such a pleasure speaking to you today. Thank you so much for coming to the show. Where can we download Fabric, how we should find uh, more information about Fabric and about you? Sure. So um, FabFM, as you said, is in the browser. So simply go to www.fabfab.fm. Fabric is available on iOS and, and Android. So if you, if you make sure if you put in sort of Fabric Entertainment, just to make sure you get it in, uh, in the app stores, you can see that there. And then I'm available on uh, social media and the email is john at aforceventures.com. Um, so uh, yeah, or I'm around town, you can find me through you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, John. It's cool. been a great pleasure. Likewise. Thank, Thank you. you.